and a very warm welcome to our attendees who have joined us this morning. My name is Ebony Holland. I'm a senior researcher with the Institute for International, the, Institu the International Institute for Environment and Development. Welcome to the event today. Today's event will focus on biodiversity loss is an underestimated risk, and we'll be looking at this from the climate development and business perspectives. So a warm welcome to all of you from, from us for this uh, important uh, opportunity to discuss risks arising from accelerating biodiversity loss. Um, I'm Jo Elliott, I work for Fauna and Flora International and we are co-hosting this event with IIED. Uh, we'd all like to thank the Understanding Risk Forum for hosting these, these sessions. And uh, I'd like to thank our three speakers who I will introduce you to shortly in turn. Um, they will each give us a short talk and then as Matt says we'll have an opportunity to do some Q&A and interaction and find out more about how our panellists are thinking about these different perspectives. A quick introduction from me before we get started. Um, in the past 50 years, um, the populations of vertebrate species that we share our planet with have declined by more than two thirds, a dramatic depopulation of wildlife, alongside a human population that has of course doubled to 7.8 billion people. And, uh, and we have extended our economic system that supports our, us as humans across more than 75% of the planet's terrestrial surface. Um, and in addition to the decline in uh, wildlife and biodiversity abundance, we're seeing a worrying acceleration in species extinctions uh, caused by the way we're using Earth's resources. Um, this scale of biodiversity loss presents us all with critical risks across multiple dimensions including development, climate and business. And our speakers today will explore these risks and uh, their implications across these three dimensions. So with no further ado, let me introduce the first of our speakers, um, Dillis Rowe. Dillis leads IIED's work on biodiversity and conservation. She focuses on the human dimensions with a particular focus on community-based conservation and on the links between biodiversity, development and well-being. Dillis, over to you. Thanks very much, Jo. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about why biodiversity loss is a risk to development. Um, and by development, I mean, you know, international development, human development in developing countries. Um, I'm going to start off by just sort of touching on what do we actually mean by biodiversity, because it's a complex and technical scientific term that is misunderstood by many. And many people, when we, when we mention the word biodiversity, if they know what it means at all, think it's about iconic species, um, or it might resonate with people that are thinking about the Amazon rainforest or coral reefs and other iconic landscapes. But biodiversity is actually much more than that. It's about the whole variety and abundance of life on Earth. It, it's a term that sums up that variety and abundance of, of life. So it's not just about iconic species such as black rhinos and Sumatran tigers, but it's also about the boring stuff, the fish, the fungi, the insects, the soil microbes, crop varieties, and also their habitats. So it's the living components of nature, and those living components often underpin the health of the non-living components of, of nature, water, soil, air, and so on. So WWF in the, um, regularly produced Living Planet report refer to nature underpinned by biodiversity, which is a nice phrase, I think, and a way of kind of thinking about the relationship between the two. And as Jo mentioned, we are facing a real natural emergency. We're losing biodiversity in, um, at an unprecedented scale. Um, she mentioned in her introduction um, various headline stats that have been generated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services by WWF and by others. One million species um, facing extinction, populations of vertebrates down by 60% since 1970, the global biomass of wild mammals down 80% since 1970, a third of global fish stocks overfished, a third of freshwater fish threatened. And not just at the species level, but also at the ecosystem level, a 47% average decline in the extent of natural ecosystems since records began, and even greater in the case of wetlands, up to 
only 3% of the oceans now free from human pressures. And even genetic diversity, 75% of crop genetic diversity lost since the 1900s. So it really is a major, major loss of biodiversity at all its different levels. And perhaps the most worrying thing is that the drivers of that loss are accelerating. So this is a, this is a nice diagram that was produced by, the, um, by ITBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and it shows the main direct drivers of biodiversity loss, uh, particularly emphasizing land and sea use change and over-exploitation. And you can see that those direct drivers are themselves driven by demographics, by macroeconomics, by institutions, by conflicts, and as we've seen recently, by epidemics such as COVID-19. So does this really matter? Are we really worried about it? Well, yes, it does, because we all depend on nature. It delivers a wide range of goods and services on which everybody depends, but particularly poor people. So this includes breathable air, fertile soil, raw materials, clean water, cultural, um, cultural dimensions, and all sorts. And diversity really matters within that. Diversity underpins the abundance and the extent and the condition of nature. And so it secures the flow of these benefits uh, to people in the future, particularly in the face of changing external environment, climate change, and, and so on. So if we lose biodiversity, we see crop yields declining, we see timber production declining, fodder production declining, all sorts of declines. We also see that nature is more vulnerable and less resilient to climate extremes, to invasion by exotic species, and to other external risks. And it has less capacity to deal with sequestering carbon and performing other basic ecological functions. So really, biodiversity, the biodiversity emergency, and it is an emergency, is also a development emergency. The global community has made significant gains in international development and poverty alleviation in the last 50 years, but biodiversity loss threatens to undermine those gains. And the impacts of loss are clear from a number of different entry points, depending on your interests in biodiversity. So if we're concerned about it from the point of thinking about the SDGs and how we might achieve them, these two nice graphics developed by the Stockholm Resilience Centre frame the SDGs in ways that demonstrate how biodiversity underpins the delivery of other SDGs, including the social and economic SDGs. So without the bio achieving the biodiversity linked SDGs, the others fall apart as well. From a development aid perspective, these are some of the priorities that aid agencies have been trying to deliver in their poverty alleviation efforts over the last 50 years. Gr economic growth, jobs, income, reducing hunger, improving health, reducing conflict and security, improving gender equality, and biodiversity loss threatens to undermine all of these. I'm not going to read through this table in detail, but things, natural resource sectors like agriculture, forestry, and fisheries are the bedrock of development. And all of these are, the productivity of all of these are undermined by biodiversity loss. On the health side, biodiversity loss means a, a, a loss of access to traditional medicines. It also means reduced options for future drug development. It means increased disease emergence and, and burden and so on. So there's all sorts of different effects that biodiversity loss has on these key development priorities. And, and from a poverty reduction perspective, well, it is the poor that will be the hardest hit. And they'll be hardest hit by biodiversity loss because they depend most directly on it for natural resources and the services that nature delivers to meet their immediate livelihood needs and also because they often can't afford substitutes for things that were previously freely available from nature, such as food, fuel, and, and so on. But quite often the poor are off also hardest hit by some of the responses to biodiversity loss. They're vulnerable to displacement and human rights abuses you know, in efforts by others, either to gain access to a rapidly dwindling biodiversity base or to conserve it. So just thinking about how we deal with this risk, 
One obvious thing is to really nature proof any investments, any development investments. And this means building biodiversity safeguards and incentives into those uh, development interventions. So at a macro scale, this might mean things like removing damaging subsidies, for example, for industrialized agriculture and fisheries, and at the same time, introducing biodiversity friendly subsidies for nature friendly development. And at a project level, it, it means thinking about possible impacts on biodiversity of interventions and screening for risks. I mean, even things like the siting of refugee camps and the type of food that's provided can have an impact on biodiversity. Um, other options are to think about how to invest in people that are resident in biodiversity rich or vulnerable areas in order to reduce their reliance on biodiversity. So this means investing in, um, in their livelihoods and in things like improved agriculture in order to reduce the risk that they will overexploit biodiversity. It means recognizing the real potential of biodiversity for development and for climate resilience and actively investing in that potential. If biodiversity loss undermines development, then tackling it can support development. So the nature-based solutions that it can offer um, can really generate um, multiple development outcomes. And finally, it means investing in elements of biodiversity that are important to poor people. So yes, of course, we are worried about elephants and tigers and rhinos, but it's really the less iconic species, crop varieties and, and the smaller stuff that is important to poor people and that really requires greater attention or at least as much attention as we give to iconic species. And finally, just to think about the, the policy angles. Um, many people in development agencies see conservation as being anti-poor. And indeed, there's lots of protected areas and other types of interventions that have had bad track records of eviction, dispossession, um, and human rights, um, other human rights abuses being meted out in the name of, of conservation. The same can be true for um, other forms of interventions in nature. So some, some, some things which are labelled as nature-based solutions aren't necessarily good for people, aren't necessarily good for nature either. So solutions that prioritise, for example, monoculture plantations of exotic species are not good for biodiversity. Solutions that mean land is appropriated for tree planting from poor people is not good for people. So we really need to think about um, ways that we can invest in conservation, in restoration, in nature-based solutions that empower poor people and at the very, very least do them no harm. We also need to think about the drivers of biodiversity loss, um, land conversion, pollution, over-exploitation, climate change, etc. These are, and the, and the underlying drivers, governance, conflicts, epidemics, um, and, and so on. These are quite often, the drivers are quite often, the, of biodiversity loss are quite often the same as the drivers of climate change and the drivers of inequality. So tackling those, un, those drivers can really deliver a triple win. And the overall, as we approach 2021, I think the key thing um, is with all the various summits that are ahead of us and the negotiations are ahead of us, that we shouldn't be thinking about just biodiversity loss, just climate change, or just development. These are interlinked challenges and they need interlinked solutions. So as we go forward into 2021, we really need to be thinking in a triple agenda rather than single agenda way in order to make sure that these challenges are addressed together and the risks of all of them are, are reduced in combination. Many thanks. Thanks, Dillis. Um, so our second speaker today is Natalie Seddon. Natalie is Professor of Biodiversity at University of Oxford and Director of the Nature Based Solutions Initiative, which is an interdisciplinary programme of research, policy, advice and education, looking at the effectiveness of nature based solutions to global challenges. And Natalie will be focusing today on the climate dimension of biodiversity risk. Natalie. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, so as Dillis um, very clearly explained, then there is growing evidence and also growing awareness that the global crises of biodiversity 
loss and climate change are deeply interlinked. Um, and it is now uh, often claimed uh, that we cannot deal with one, one uh, problem without also addressing the other, as, again, as Dillis, as Dillis said. And in particular, in recent months, we've been hearing a great deal about the idea that biodiversity can support climate action in particular through so-called nature-based solutions. And this is an idea that has uh, gained huge traction in government, in businesses, and among the general public. So over the next uh, 10 minutes, I want to unpack this a bit. I want to discuss how biodiversity loss and climate change are linked. And I want to particularly explain why it is that the diversity of nature from the level of the gene to the level of the ecosystem is particularly important when it comes to addressing the causes and also the consequences of climate change. So we know that the main direct cause of biodiversity loss is land and sea use change, largely for industrial scale food production, which drives an estimated 30% of biodiversity declines across the globe. This is followed by the overexploitation, so overfishing and overhunting, which drives around 20%. Climate change, meanwhile, although currently ranked the third most significant driver of biodiversity loss, massively amplifies the effects of all the other stresses, for example, the fragmentation of landscapes. Um, and uh, it's predicted, the key thing about climate change is it, it's accelerating and it's predicted to become the main uh, cause of biodiversity declines in the coming decades. You know, biodiversity um, changes in climate cause organisms to sh shift their ge geographical ranges and often as a result of the way humans are managing the lands, there is then nowhere to go. Also, climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of fires and storms and this can destroy or badly damage entire ecosystems, undermine their integrity so they can no longer function and support biodiverse assemblages. Now at the same time, ecosystems on land and in the sea play a critical role in the global carbon cycle. So agriculture, forestry and other land use activities account for around 23% of human greenhouse gas emission, emissions. At the same time, terrestrial ecosystems are estimated to draw down around well, between 20 and 30% of carbon dioxide emissions and the oceans are thought to remove around 30%. Therefore, in theory, addressing land and sea use change through the protection, the restoration and the sustainable management of our ecosystems, in other words, through good nature-based solutions, should help slow warming and also arrest biodiversity uh, declines. The other point, uh, I think, especially important for this particular um, webinar, this particular audi audience, there is also much evidence that working with biodiverse nature can also help address the impacts of climate change. Um, Nature-based solutions underpinned by biodiversity can support human adaptation to climate change in various ways. And there are three main ways that I thought would be worth just very briefly describing. So first of all, and perhaps most obviously, nature-based solutions can reduce the exposure of communities, of agricultural lands, of infrastructure to the immediate impacts of climate change. So for example, if we restore and if we protect our coastal habitats, our salt marshes, our mangroves and so forth, there's good evidence that this can really help defend against storms, against flood damage and so forth. Meanwhile, if we restore and work with our wetlands and our forests and our catchments, this can improve water security, reduce the risk of floods, soil erosion and landslides that are brought about by extreme weather events. And green infrastructure in cities, for example, can provide cooling functions and can also help to abate, abate floods and also bring you know, countless mental and physical health benefits to, to, to city dwellers. So that's the first way. The second way is that nature-based solutions can reduce social sensitivity to the impacts of climate change. For example, by supporting the diversification of sources of income, of sources of food, and thereby, thereby providing nutritional and financial security when crops or all the usual sources of income fail during, a climate, during climate extremes. And of course, this is particularly important in the global south where dependency on nature for food and income is particularly high. The third way, and perhaps the less talked about way, is that nature-based solutions or working with nature can really reduce vulnerability to climate impacts by building what's called adaptive capacity. So this is through the building social, um, social capital, in other words, through the process of being involved with designing and implementing the nature-based interventions. This empowers people and equips them with knowledge and resources that will enable them to prepare for future climate impacts. This so-called adaptive capacity in turn can improve or enhance the stewardship of ecosystems so that can then ensure the flow of benefits from nature to people.
So in summary of all that, biodiversity loss in the form of a loss and damage to ecosystems is a big driver of climate change, while climate change is fast becoming the biggest driver of biodiversity loss. So by restoring our ecosystems, protecting them, we can help reduce emissions and enhance carbon stores, and thereby help to slow warming, whilst also building the resilience of societies and ecosystems. But this is the basic idea of nature-based solutions, but I can't emphasize this enough. Nature-based solutions and biodiversity can only support people if we also decarbonize our economy. This really isn't an either or situation because warming damages ecosystems and their capacity to provide all these benefits to people in a warming world. So we need to therefore treat offsetting schemes with extreme caution and perhaps that might be something we want to circle back to. But the big question is why specifically does the erosion of the diversity of life matter so much for climate change? After all, there are around 12 million species, um, probably more than that, on planet Earth. Can we afford to lose the 1 million species predicted to go extinct in the recent global assessment report produced by, by ITBES? And the answer is no. Diversity matters enormously. Why? Basically, diversity is our insurance policy. And let me, let me go on to explain what I mean by that. So, and Dillis in fact touched on this in, in her presentation, but obviously for nature to deliver benefits to people over the long term, whether they're climate change benefits or other benefits, the ecosystems involved must themselves be healthy and functionally resilient to environmental change. In other words, they must be able to resist and or recover quickly from perturbations and from climate change. So in other words, functionally resilient ecosystems are the foundation of sustainable nature-based solutions. And there is now much evidence, much observational, much empir empirical experimental evidence that has been um, collected, particularly over the last 40 years, that um, eco the resistance and resilience of an ecosystem and hence of the people who depend upon it is strongly determined by its connectivity to other ecosystems across the landscape, as well as by the diversity of genes, of ecological traits or species contained within its communities of animals, fungi, plants, bacteria and so forth. Connectivity is really important. So connectivity is a property of biodiversity and connectivity is very important because this allows species to track their preferred ecological niches across a landscape under climate change. Meanwhile, diversity, species richness across all those different groups that I mentioned, buffers ecosystems against perturbation via so-called insurance effects. And this is variation in space and time, some complementarity between species in their, in, in their um, ecological functions. In other words, if you have lots of species, when the environmental conditions change under climate change, there is a higher probability that a subset of those species will be able to continue functioning and support, and support ecosystem services and the people who depend upon them. So there's lots of examples of this, and obviously I'm not going to go into all of them, but just, just relevant to this particular conversation. There's lots of evidence that natural forests and, very, and mixed species forest plantations have much more stable carbon stores during, car than cl during climate extremes compared to species poor plantations. And we find the same uh, findings with grasslands as well. Low diversity grassland pl plots have much less resilience to droughts and other climate extremes than high diversity grassland plots. And similarly, compared to low diversity plantations, very biodiverse natural forests and areas allowed to regenerate naturally have, low, have lower resilience to fires, to pests and diseases, all of which are becoming much more common under climate change, and that they also support a wider range of ecosystem services. And it's not just found in plants, we also found they find these, these patterns in all sorts of different um, groups as well. More diverse coral reefs, for example, have more stable e ecosystem functions, more community stability, and again, greater resilience to disturbance. But it's very complicated. Increasing native, and that's key, natural biodiversity is usually associated with improved ecosystem functions and services, but the relationship is non-linear and its direction and strength can vary among different types of species. And this is really important to bear in mind. For example, the removal of a keystone species from a habitat through overhunting or overfishing, which commonly happens, has a very negative effect on ecological functioning. Whereas if we lose species that share very similar traits with other species in the community, then their loss would have less effect. 
The problem is when it comes to biodiversity loss, it's usually the keystone species that go first. And an ecosystem may appear to have lots of species in it and may appear to be buzzing with life and thriving. But if it has lost the main species that disperse the seeds of large tree species, for example, um, that health is an illusion and the ecosystem will eventually collapse and its carbon stores and so forth will then be released into the atmosphere. So to conclude, the maintenance or enhancements of natural biodiversity needs to be considered a critical element of su successful sustainable nature-based solutions to climate change. As Dilla said, biodiversity is not wildlife, it's just it's not a luxury or a nice to have an additional benefit of working from working with nature. Biodiversity is that which secures the flow of all that we need now and into the future. It ensures the stability, productivity and resilience of our ecosystems and in a rapidly changing world that's absolutely essential. In other words, if we don't ensure that biodiversity is supported or enhanced as we design our nature-based solutions, then nature won't be able to provide any benefits to people at all. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Natalie. So thanks both to Natalie and Dillis. Let's have our third speaker before we move on to a, a hopefully a rather interesting and, and um, solution-focused discussion and of some of your Q&A. Um, our third speaker is Liz, Liz Rogers. Liz is Vice President for Environmental Technology at BP International. She le has led the development and deployment of new technologies there, including those related to carbon capture. She supports broad engagement in climate science, including natural climate solutions. And she's currently working on the development of BP's sustainability frame. So Liz, thank you very much for coming to share your thoughts with us. Pleasure, Joe. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here at this important event. And uh, thanks to our other two speakers. Uh, that was a great, great presentation. But now let's turn to why biodiversity loss matters to business. And uh, I'll be talking about, uh, of course, why it matters to BP in particular. Um, at BP, we recognize that there's an intrinsic link between the need for global action on climate change and biodiversity. And of course, as we've heard this morning, the strong link to society. Um, why does global biodiversity loss matter to business? Well, we've heard quite a few uh, examples this morning already, um, but it's clear and we all know, and it's worth reinforcing this, the world is on an unsustainable path. Biodiversity loss is happening now. And we not only need to avoid the risk of biodiversity loss accelerating, but also focus on how we stop biodiversity loss happening and help regenerate nature. There are a number of points on this slide. I'm not going to speak to, to all of them, uh, but why uh, global biodiversity loss matters to business. I'm just going to highlight a few. Uh, one in particular around financial institutions. Increasingly, there's great interest from investors on environment and social uh, govern and governance issues. So they're, they're sort of abbreviated to the sort of ESG issues. And those uh, also include how we're managing biodiversity risk. These usually show up as ESG ratings or ESG assessment of companies' performance. And these are increasingly informing investment decisions. Another key area is um, the private sector's role in providing input as well as obviously delivering uh, international policies, goals and targets, and also managing compliance with new um, and emerging regulations in this area. And, and I'll come back to that at the very end. And uh, as we've just heard uh, from uh, Natalie as well in particular, uh, there are huge opportunities for us in business to learn from nature. And just uh, building on Natalie's presentation as an example, um, understanding the importance of natural carbon cycles and how to conserve these and perhaps even enhance them, um, particularly in part with nature-based solutions. So those, those are just a few reasons why, why biodiversity loss matters to business. But what does this mean from a, a BP point of view? Earlier this year, BP announced a new purpose to reimagine energy for people and our planet. And we also announced a new sustainability frame, which includes these three interconnected focus areas, getting to net zero, improving people's lives and care for our planet. Now our ambition is to get to net zero by 2050 or sooner. 
and help the world to do the same. And that's, that's all about our ambitions uh, to reduce emissions, uh, not only from our operations, but also uh, from the product, products that we sell. We've launched our new business strategy uh, in August this year that will reshape our business in BP within a decade as we pivot from an international oil company focused on producing resources to an integrated energy company focused on delivering solutions. Now, over, over time, of course, our wide ranging approach to sustainability has brought benefits, but often at a local scale. And now we believe we can do more by being focused and setting global priorities to drive our activities around the world. And of course, one of these priorities is to promote cleaner environments, enhance biodiversity, and promote natural climate solutions. And just as a reminder, as we've talked about, this is because the continued decline in biodiversity and the degradation of our environment poses serious risks, as we've heard about this morning, to the natural environment and the natural resources upon which we all depend. And it's reducing the ability of ecosystems to take carbon out of the atmosphere, as an example, uh, which makes it harder to tackle issues like climate change. BP is making significant investments in natural climate solutions, and we're also working to strengthen and unify existing environmental standards and principles for natural climate solutions and the co-benefits that they can provide, including society, those to society. Now, we're, um, we launched these in, uh, in September, and we are working together with uh, different organizations, uh, including FFI and IUCN and others, to really help think through how we deepen these into a series of objectives and targets. And we've just recently held some workshops to help us think through those, and we'll be reporting on progress uh, on those later this, um, well, actually, early next year. So let's move on to the next slide and what we're doing uh, in terms of enhancing biodiversity and uh, the recent position uh, that we announced in June. Uh, because managing biodiversity impacts and risks, of course, is, is nothing new uh, in BP. And biodiversity management has been integrated into our internal processes, including risk management procedures, for a long time. And over that time, we've learned a lot, uh, both good and bad. And we realized that we need to upscale our approach to biodiversity, again, for all the reasons that we've heard this morning. As I mentioned in June, we launched our new biodiversity position uh, that this uh, slide talks to. And a few things I just wanted to pull out in terms of our new position here. Uh, we've committed to uh, that there'll be no, oil and, no new oil and gas uh, exploration or production in the most sensitive protected areas. And we've defined those as World Heritage Sites and the IUCN Category 1A and 1B Sites. In addition, uh, we, will, we want to have um, a clear pathway and setting out our actions to help restore, maintain and enhance nature, which includes these other three points. Having a net positive impact on biodiversity from our new projects, enhancing biodiversity around existing uh, operating sites, and supporting biodiversity restoration work in countries where we work, and support the sustainable use of natural resources by local communities. Now, working to uh, help us develop that position, uh, we've been working with a number of people, but in particular, uh, Flora, Fauna and Flora International. And uh, we're pleased to say uh, that in September, we signed a new agreement with FFI uh, to launch a new five-year collaboration and partnership uh, and in particular, uh, some of the sort of priority focus is really helping us work on metrics around net positive impact that will help us demonstrate progress. So we need to, we believe we need to make transformative changes. I think we've heard again, uh, quite a few reasons why we need to make transformative changes. Uh, and in particular through collective action across all sectors, government, businesses, non-governmental organizations and civil society alike. Of course, governments have a vital role in creating the right conditions and incentives 
through longer term and coherent national policy frameworks and allowing the private sector to also play a big role. And businesses such as ours are forming new partnerships. I've just talked about our partnership and, and long relationship with FFI. But another example is work we're doing at Teesside in the UK, where working with our partners, uh, we're working on how to bring biodiversity management as an integral part of one of the UK's decarbonised industrial hubs. Now, in conclusion, uh, businesses, I think, need to upscale real action for biodiversity cons conservation, increase the use of nature-based solutions, and at BP, we'll also be supporting major conservation projects in countries where we work, and we'll provide more details on that next year. We think we need to integrate the importance of biodiversity into business decision-making, and I think uh, a lot of, lot of um, organizations, including the World Economic Forum, um, have also sort of pointing at this. Uh, and just as an example, what we're thinking about is how to include uh, biodiversity into our business decision making, uh, into our capital allocation processes. So going beyond the normal risk assessment processes of, of, uh, that, that are in place today. We need to work together. Of course, we need to work together to solve some of these problems and where we absolutely need to be opening to listening, um, be open to listening, really listening, uh, not just with the people we, we agree with, but with people who can provide solutions, but also who have maybe opposing views because we all need to come together to solve some of these really complex challenges. And we need to encourage others to pursue opportunities for this, these collective actions as well. For example, raising standards across sectors. And we're working with IPICA, which is the Trade Association for Environmental and Social Issues in the Oil and Gas Industry, and the Cross-Sector Biodiversity Initiative. And of course, we need to work with some of our partners to adopt similar approaches. So the need for action is clear, and why this matters to business is very clear. It's critical that we get on and deliver real tangible progress to the, together for biodiversity, but for climate, people, and the planet, and do that in an integrated way. And I completely agree with the other uh, speakers this morning, Dillard and Natalie, in the integrated way and approach is, is very important, but also so is the need to take action now. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, much appreciate the opportunity to share that with you. Marvellous. Can we reassemble our panel, please? And we'll have a, I think we've got a few minutes that we can actually have a bit of uh, Q&A. And I've had a few questions come through. Um, so let me first, with, with no further ado, let me, um, looking forwards as the world comes out of the pandemic and as we head for this critical biodiversity and climate year 2021 that we hope will set the frame for looking at risk through a different lens, what measures do what, what let's keep, keep this fairly short if we can because of time but maybe one or two measures what do you hope for as uh, measures of progress over the next period that will actually ensure that na nature is in its appropriate place in decision making as it moves forward what would you hope to see over the next 12 months or so Let, let's start with um dillis perhaps on that one thanks joe um so I guess I'll start with a, a major concern um, as, as well as what I would hope for. I mean, my, my concern is that despite all the rhetoric about, um, you know, recognizing that the pandemic is partly related to our broken relationship with nature and the need to mend that relationship, that economic priorities will override that, you know, that sort of moment, brief moment of enlightenment and that the sort of you know, talk about green COVID recovery will just turn into talk about let's just build back as quickly as possible um, in order to restore our economies, you know, and sod the environment again as it was before. So I think that that is sort of my major fear and my major hope is that that doesn't happen, that we really do get serious about, um, about green investments um, and green recovery, not just recovery at all costs. But that does require a huge political shift and um, you know that is really transformation at the scale that we need it but that at a scale that we know is 
a political hot potato. So yeah, that, that, that's, it'll be interesting to see how much um, that does come to, all, the, all this talk this year comes to bear next year. Thank you. And Nat Natalie, how hopeful are you with your role at COP26? We're expecting great things. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a slightly different question. I mean, what, what, do I, what, do, what do we need, what do I believe we need to see in the next 12 months? And yeah. that is signs of real systemic change. So move from pledges and everybody talking the talk about nature-based solutions to actually backing that up with solid, sustainable flows of finance, with verifiable action plans. And in particular, all those entities across business and government that are committing to investing in so-called nature-based solutions are only doing so if they also have um, credible and ambitious pathways to achieving net zero and credible ambitious pathways to in removing loss and damage to biodiversity in their supply chains because if they are instead offsetting their damaging their activities that are harming the biosphere and harming the climate by investments in nature-based solutions then we're going to be toast because unless we keep fossil fuels in the ground uh, we are going to warm beyond uh, the, the environment so much that we you know that the, the sustainability of humanity and biodiversity on the planet will be compromised and that's the bottom line everything else otherwise is rearranging affairs on the titanic yeah and let me liz let me ask you if you want to respond to that before maybe we ask our our panelists to to talk to one another about this liz what, what's your sense of <clears throat> that large scale uh, measure that might uh, enable a response along the lines of those that Dillis and Natalie have called for? Well, I think, I think it's very important that we're, you know, we recognise that we're in a world of transition. You know, we're moving from absolutely uh, a world of uh, fossil fuel based energy systems. Um, and it's, you know, it is, it is going to take time, uh, but actually signs are encouraging that we are sort of transitioning. Um, and we're sort of learning by doing, but we, I completely agree, we need to be in action. Uh, we need to remind ourselves about, uh, you know, what the benefits and that there were benefits of, you know, people sort of um, people in lockdown, which is, I mean, you know, there were lots of disadvantages, but one of the benefits was people realised the true value of nature, you know, cleaner air, the, the opportunity to benefit from nature, particularly from a mental well-being. You know, and it really connected people back to nature. So going forward in building back better, building back in a, in a more resilient way, understanding the benefits of nature and how we can sort of bring those in to accelerate our transition to cleaner energy and cleaner energy systems is, is really important. Um, and I, so I, I do think, I do think that's, that's quite critical and, and having uh, the commitment to building back better decarbonizing our energy systems, uh, having targets and making real tangible progress and demonstrating progress will, will be essential. And as I mentioned in my talk, I think, I think it's uh, all, all of us have a role to play, governments, non-governmental organizations, um, businesses, and, and we've got to work together, but, but I agree, you know, we do, do need tangible action. And if we focus specifically on the question of risk, which was the topic of this, uh, um, this discussion, do we see um, ways in which risk could be better measured, better integrated into decision making? I keep hearing that the finance sector is getting on top of this and that we're getting some really good, much more objective and verifiable sense of how nature could be built into monitoring and decision making and so on. What's, what's the panel's view of progress we're making on risk? Liz, maybe I'll start with you on that one first as our corporate representative. Do you, do you think there's, there's ways in which you know the whole sector can better understand and disclose risk it's one of the questions that have come up in the in the chat box yeah i mean i mean that's the journey you know that's the journey we've been on 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 climate um and you know over the years that i've been working in this industry i mean i've been working you know for 30 plus years um and actually you know the journey we've been on particularly on climate and climate related risks and disclosing information not only around um, you know, emissions and emission numbers, but also how we understand um, adaptation and resilience. And now it's linked, of course, to the transition pathway. Um, metrics are important. Uh, integration into business decision-making is important, as I mentioned in my talk. Um, and incorporating 
incorporating aspects of biodiversity and nature-based solutions and so on, you know, that, that is all now in play and will be an important part of, um, of the discussion in terms of measuring performance, but also helping people understand why it's important to actually take, include this as an integral part of your business processes, right up and including board considerations, board level discussions. Natalie, what's your sense of risk and how, what mechanisms are out there for to better manage the risk side? Do you, do, you, do you see that as being a tool that will be used more effectively? Well, I think so. I think there's sort of wide, widespread acknowledgement, uh, including it's being pushed up by the World Economic Forum as well, that you know the loss of biodiversity and climate change pre presents all different categories, all different types of risk, opportunity risks and risks to asset risks to supply chains. There's all sorts of different types of risks, and there's an acknowledgement that you know that this is happening. But so long as uh, corporate um, strategies of tackling risk are, are uh, based on this idea of net biodiversity you know no net loss or offsetting which is another way it makes the assumption that it's okay to have some damage somewhere when it really isn't <laughs> so we need to get I think away from this idea of, 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 of no net loss towards and when, certainly when it comes to biodiversity no loss at all so I would say that we're under uh, that corporations are underestimating the risks to their operations and their profit margins by thinking in terms of no net loss that would be my uh, view on that Lot, lots of very interesting stuff to unpack there among the science <laughs> and the decision making and so on Dillis anything you'd like to say well just only to say that it's great that biodiversity risk is finally getting the attention it deserves it's been something that has been flagged by others you know probably for 10 if not 15 years and it's something that's you know constantly been pushed to one side and I think it applies not just to corporate sector and the finance sector but also to development organizations you know just thinking about you know that's what I meant in many ways in terms of thinking about how we nature proof our investments that you don't just go along and, and um, screen I mean we've got some kind of screening for climate change um, impacts currently is, is fairly mainstream for development organizations but we do routinely need to look at you know what are the biodiversity risks of these planned developments um, as well as what are, what are the climate risks and have strategies in place to deal with that so we need much better mechanisms better metrics and, and systems across the board in order to be able to manage that but at least sort of a, acknowledging that this is now an issue is um is a major step forward yeah very much so um lots to unpack there It'd be great to understand more about the the task force on nature related financial disclosure as well which we know is one of the opportunities coming forwards that might actually help with making some of this a little bit more transparent and visible and monitorable um, but we, we are starting to run out of time so I thought we might just have one final question which somebody has posed to us in the chat which is sort of exemplars of good work are there might you each have one example you could bring to us of something that you think is working and that others can draw from as a uh, you know a, a, an example of how how biodiversity and nature risks are being better addressed and thought about whether that's a, a project or an initiative or just something you read recently you know is there something where which gives you a sense that that there are you know there are good ideas out there that we can and we can en en enhance and maybe lift up to a to a higher scale Dillis you're nodding <laughs> well I think there's so many good <laughs> ideas out there it's difficult to pick a few one of the things that IED is interested in is um, thinking about how we can um, use debt swaps for improved climate and nature performance, um, recognizing that um, developing countries had a lot of debt before COVID-19. They've now got even more debt. Um, asset managers are the holders of a lot of that debt and are beginning to build in climate considerations. So, um, you know, in many ways, debt relief can be a way of, of um, fulfilling some of those climate commitments. So I, I think that sort of whole era, area of, of debt swaps is an interesting one. But I wouldn't be IID if I didn't say that really, I think that the most, a lot of the innovation is happening at the local level. So these are global challenges, but development is felt at the local level. Climate change impacts are felt at the local level, as is biodiversity loss. So it's really those local level solutions of which there are hundreds um, um, so I'm not going to pick out a couple 
but how we kind of pick those up, amplify them, scale them up so that they can have the kind of impact that we need beyond the local level, I, th I think is where, you know, is, is really exciting and interesting. Good, brilliant. Liz, any, any suggestions from you? Yeah, well, just a, a sort of a parochial one, but, but I, I do think Dillis is absolutely right. Um, and just you know, Light Source BP, which is a, a joint venture uh, for solar power, um, we've, which is now actually 10 years old uh, as of the 1st of December. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to sort of mention is, is, you know, in the energy transition, as we transition to cleaner forms and decarbonized energy, we've got to keep the pressure on uh, making sure we manage that responsibly. And we actually, you know, learn and make sure from an environmental and social point of view that actually we don't cause more harm. Um, Light Source BP, uh, just as a small example, uh, where they're putting their, their solar uh, arrays on land, uh, they're also uh, integrating wildflower conservation or planting wildflowers to encourage pollination and bees and beekeeping and honey production. So it's a small contribution to conservation. It's a small contribution to pollination and bees and so on, but, but also um, with sort of local input from sort of livelihood around honey sales. Now, it's a tiny sort of piece in a much bigger issue, but actually the CEO of Lightsource BP, the fact that they've done this and committed to it and then can scale it up and sort of influence others thinking about renewable forms of energy, what more can you do in terms of additive to, to bring in that connection with nature uh, is, I think, really important. Thanks, Liz. And Natalie, can it close us out with, with, a, with an idea that you've, you, you appreciate? What I wanted to say was to strongly endorse what Dillis said. <laughs> In fact, she said exactly the kind of thing I was going to say. There are thousands of projects. And I, you know, one of the best bits about working in this space is sort of finding out almost on a daily basis about other new and amazing ways local communities across the world, whether it's, you know, women leading mangrove restoration projects in the Cameroon and the Philippines to farmer led rewilding on the coast and then the highlands of the UK to all those that are bringing wildlife into cities and green spaces and improving, you know, the quality of life for people living in cities. You know, what whatever it is there's a huge amount of innovation there and you know and a lot of knowledge at the local level and the best sorts of nature-based solutions are those ones the ones that come from the communities because those are the ones that will scale out and will spread fantastic examples of all these these projects happening irrespective of the chaos that might be going on you know in the government and administrative level so we can spotlight those and i think a real really an important thing for us to do in the next um 12 months is really spotlight those projects and point to governments and businesses and say this is the kind of thing that we need to federate and take to scale and I think what we really need to be thinking about, you know, there's an awful lot of potential finance out there for these projects. And we need to be creating these boundary organizations that enable the channeling of good investors. So to go back to what I said before, the investors that have strong and, and verifiable, credible decarbonization um, plans uh, with those projects that are led by people that support biodiversity. And there are so many of those. So we need to match this up. We need to work together. And those boundary organizations are, you know, people from all sorts of dis different disciplines to ensure that this, that all that funding isn't um, poorly invested and doesn't do more harm than good. And that, thank you very much. And I will then add a, a final comment from an FFI point of view as well, which is this exact, we have a campaign at the moment called Our One Home, and it is calling for channeling new funding down to local initiatives, recognizing that these local initiatives are where we can make it, yeah. uh, make all of these things come together. So thank you very much, panel. We're out of time. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you, participants. And, um, and please enjoy the rest of these sessions. Thank you and goodbye.